Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to my um, uh, presentation. So today, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about a, a research area called underwater wireless networks. So in this uh, talk, I will first introduce what it is and why it is important. And then uh, I will talk about uh, my research experience in this uh, particular area. Um, not, in, not only um, talking about the series, but also uh, show you some systems we have, we have built over the years. So first, um, well, even though we call the planet the Earth, but it is actually a, a water planet with about 71% covered by, by water. The, well, the ocean is a very critical resource of our society. It has tremendous amount of uh, resources, natural resources. It's home to numerous species. And it also has huge impact on the Earth's climate change. According to a United Nations study, um, right now about 40% of the world's population uh, lives within 100 kilometers off the coast, just like you and me, uh, we are. So needless, needless to say, it is in, very important uh, to, to the human beings. However, it's also a changing and sometimes threatened environment. The water world has um, fascinated us for, for a long time. So the exploration of the world war, the war, water world has never ceased in a human history. We go to the ocean for, like this uh, page shows, we go to the ocean for, for energy. Um, we also look into the ocean for, for our own history. Um, Sometimes we also look into the ocean for a missing aircraft. You know, uh, many years ago, uh, maybe ten years ago already, um, there's a there's a there's a Malaysian flight disappeared uh, out of nowhere. We still we still haven't found it. Um, but most importantly. Uh, we would like to better understand the underwater environment and keep track of their conditions because they are so important to us. Uh, therefore, significant effort has been made in underwater observatories. So this page shows, um, get a pointer. This page shows a few pictures of such efforts in measuring ocean variables on the coastal, regional, and even global scales. They are important for a wide variety of applications, such as uh, ocean, ocean, uh, ocean, oceanography, uh, pollution detection, uh, for it, also um, underwater surveillance. Well, despite all the, the efforts, we, you probably heard about this. We still don't know a lot about the ocean. We, we, we very often heard the scientist says that we know more about the moon than our own ocean. Why that is the case? Well, one of the reasons is the lack of efficient wireless underwater communication and networking capacity. Existing underwater observatories are mostly cabled in nature, meaning that they, they run a long, very long subsea cables. But they are very expensive and uh, it, it is difficult to, to maintain. Also, uh, if a single point along the cable is damaged, then the entire system um, is not going to work. 
So those are the limitations about the about the subsea cables. Here on the right hand side, we show a picture of those uh, subsea cables, and uh, we will will not go into the details of the of the design, but just let you know that those cables are very expensive. Some of the <clears throat> the cables under the, uh, the Mediterranean uh, Ocean uh, cost about ninety thousand per kilometer, and um, some new new newer ones uh, that that goes across the the Pacific Ocean uh, can cost twenty eight thousand per kilometer. So they are not they are not cheap, uh, but still they they are difficult to maintain and uh, uh, has the problem of single point of failure. So what we do, <clears throat> what I do at the city college, uh, I'm working on the, the next generation technology, which introduces a wireless network into the water world. The <clears throat> introduction of network concept is, is, is more than just going from the traditional, um, the radio, like walkie-talkie technology to, to things like 5G. Um, the, this new technology will enable us to, to quickly deploy it on the water systems that can collect data and, 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 and deliver them timely, or well, deliver them in a timely, reliably, and wireless uh, uh, fashion through the water to, to meet the, the ever-growing uh, requirements of the ocean exploration. So this technology will make significant uh, scientific, uh, economic, and societal impact. The advantages of the, these technologies are as follows. Um, it's cost effective uh, because cables are, are expensive and we can deploy our system quickly. The system will be more flexible um, in terms of configuration because, well, you know, no string attached. And, uh, and the system can be very re robust and, and, and reliable because um, we don't have the, the single point of failure issue. We don't need to worry about that. So this can open up a, a, a lot of uh, uh, capabilities in the in the in the scientific uh, community. Uh, we can support oceanography and, and underwater archaeology and, and many other applications. Uh, for the environment, we can we can do things like pollution detection. We can monitor the, the climate change. We can watch the ocean um, to see if there's a signs of global global warming. Commercially, you know, the industry, uh, those big oil and natural gas companies, they have tons of uh, facilities under the, the sea. So this, this network can help them uh, to do remote monitoring and control. Um, and also, um, it can benefit fishery and other other applications. Um, well, apparently, this technology can also be used in in the defense sector, such as navy, coastal guard, harbor protection, and port port control. Okay, th so this this idea sounds good. <laughs> it's 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 great actually, but why ha you haven't done it already? What are the the challenges? Well, the thing is, the ocean is not for the faint of heart. It takes a lot to even survive this harsh environment. Really. So let me show you one picture. So I took this picture. When, uh, when we were deploying our sensors over there, uh, blocked by this uh, screen, 
And a few seconds later, um, all of us were wet. And that's, that's not even a bad day. That's, a, that's just a regular day uh, on the high seas. So, uh, well, uh, in, in addition to the, the sea, sea condition, there are actually uh, some challenges for underwater uh, communication and networking. Um, first of all, the, hot, hot, the very harsh uh, sea environment means that your, your device is, is, is prone to, to failure. And, um, and also everything that you put in the ocean, they're gonna move. Okay, so mobility can be a problem. Other than that, uh, there are some challenges to the to communication as well. Um, you know, on, on land we use radio frequency uh, or RF for communicate uh, for wireless communication. However, it doesn't work in water. The energy will be quickly absorbed uh, in the ocean, so they they cannot travel very well, uh, and we cannot use them as a means of wireless communication. Then how about optic, optical communication? Well, optical communication uh, is good for, for its uh, very high bandwidth. However, similar to the RF or radio signals, or well, in fact, optical is also a type of magnetic waves and magnetic waves, they do not work well, very well in the water. Um, in, well, in some system, well, the, the scientists that design some very uh, powerful laser, underwater laser systems that can, they can go uh, relatively further, but, you know, they can work well in very clear water, but in some, well, actually in many parts of the world, the water are pretty murky, meaning that uh, you're your optical communication will not work very well in that environment. So then what do we, well, how do we communicate? Well, uh, we had to switch to acoustics, basically sound. Uh, we learned this from the, uh, from the marine animals. Uh, we try to use acoustic signals to carry our digital information. But this also has its own limitation that we have to, to deal with. First of all, the, the signal travels much slower compared to the radio. Um, in water, the sound travels at uh, 1500 meter per second, whereas the radio in the air, it's three, times 10 to the power of eight meters per second. A huge, huge difference. That means it takes a lot longer for your signal to, to go from point A to point B. So that's one of the, the special property of underwater wireless communication. Uh, number two is the, the low bandwidth. And uh, therefore, uh, you, you have very slow data rate. You're looking at, well, on land, we're, ta we're talking about gigabit per second. Um, but in the water, uh, right now, it's still kilobit per second. Again, um, huge, huge difference. Number three, uh, the property number three is the very high error probability. So in the, uh, for our cell phones or Wi-Fi, the error rate is actually pretty low. It's usually in the order of uh, 10 to the power of negative six. But for, on, for underwater communication, if you can reach an error rate of 10 to the power of negative four, you're all, you already have a very good system. So again, another big difference over there. So to counter all this, to address all these issues, we cannot just use whatever 
available for the, let's say, Wi-Fi or 5G, 4G. We cannot use those technologies directly. But instead, we have to conduct new research at pretty much every level of the networking uh, protocol stack. So that's why um, it's still it's still work in progress. You know, on land we're we're already talking about five G, four G, five G, and and in the future there will be six G. But in the water we don't have one G yet. So that's how how difficult it is. Um, oh, here also on this page, um, there's a special, there's there's a unique uh, problem with with acoustic signal, is that your signal is gonna bounce back from the surface and the bottom. So a single signal uh, will travel through different paths, and then when they arrive at the destination you can actually create interference to yourself. That's another, uh, that's another effect we, we, we need to handle. So to address all these uh, challenges for the, for the past uh, many, many years, I have conducted a lot of research on, uh, uh, on various uh, topics. So that's the second uh, second item I would like to discuss today. You know, the network uh, is organized into what we call a protocol stack. There are many different layers. Um, typical networking problems including, include the following. Um, there's uh, something called a reliable data transfer. So how to, how to make sure your data can be can be delivered reliably. Um, there's uh, uh, efficient data delivery. So the so efficiency, uh, we're focusing on the energy efficiency, efficiency. Efficiency, how to deliver the data uh, with less, using less energy. Also, uh, you, this is a unique feature for underwater because uh, in, in some, uh, in underwater wireless communication, the your signal uh, it work better if you know where your receiver is, but knowing that is an, a separate issue, or, or it's actually a very big research topic. It's called localization and positioning. On land, we don't have that. We don't need to worry about much about that because we have GPS. Um, uh, on top of, uh, uh, well, we have satellites on, uh, in the space, so we can use GPS system, but we, we cannot do that in the water. So that's a localization and positioning is, a, is still a challenge for underwater system. Next is called uh, time synchronization. Um, because you cannot sync synchronize your time with the satellite. So how to do that efficiently in the water uh, is another issue. Uh, moving down the list, efficient multiple access. Uh, this is one of the fundamental networking problem. Um, basically how to share the channel with uh, multiple users. And then, um, how to do high data rate uh, transmission. So is like video streaming even actually possible? We're still uh, working on that. So uh, with all these uh, problems, our objectives, objectives are building efficient, reliable, and robust underwater wireless sensor networks. So on the front of uh, reliable data transfer, um, on land, people use, uh, uh, it's called an end-to-end -end approach. Uh, I mean, if you heard of something like TCP IP. So TCP is actually one of the reliable data transfer protocol. 
it hand it does the congestion control it, it does the error uh, correction um so it does a lot of things um it the way it does it is it, it um uh, it takes the 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 networking nodes or routers in the middle as a transparent as a black box, and the TCP works from one end of the network to another end. Okay, so that's that's why we call that end-to-end -end approach. This works well uh, on a, on the internet, um, where you have very little latency. Well, compared to to underwater system, we cannot do that in the in the water because when there's a large propagation delay, meaning that the signal takes forever to to travel from point A to point B, then this end to end approach will have a huge end to end delay. So this is not really uh, really feasible in the water. Um, other than TCP like uh, type approach, there's something called ARQ type. So this is hop by hop. Well, but the performance will degradate because of the frequent uh, acknowledgement. Third approach, typical approach is called uh, the pure uh, feedback free protocol. And uh, well, additional energy is always used for the data transfer, uh, irrespective of the channel condition. So, uh, comparing all this this method, we we propose some uh, some good options. So, one of them is called hybrid ARQ uh, based method that can that can that can give uh, better performance. A second promising idea is called the coding based method um, to improve the robustness of the system. So one of the our previous work uh, published in 2020, uh, uh, 2010 is called uh, SDRT. So the basic idea is using this ARQ uh, plus FEC. So FEC, if you're not familiar, it's, uh, it's forward error correction. So it's a it's a correction code, and we also uh, introduced the transmission window control. And and this method can can eliminate eliminate the following different collisions. Uh, the first type of collision is called the data and acknowledge collision. So basically, when you're sending the data, and your receiver is uh well. On a sender, you keep sending data, but your receiver wants to acknowledge your the packet. When that happens, there's a data to acknowledge um, collision. Uh, in addition to that, you can have sender re sending receiving collision. Um, uh, when you have a, a big network, you have a you have a several nodes. One in the middle is acting as a relay. So when that happens, your the sending of the first node and uh, the sending of the second node, uh, they will, they will well, what we call this collide, uh, there will be a collision. So your, the block from node one will not be received by node two. The third type of this collision is called the overhearing collision. So what happened is, uh, for example, we have uh, four nodes. Node one keeps sending um, you know, to the packet, and then uh, node three is also sending, but node three is sending to node four. The thing is that this uh, in the in the underwater uh, transmission, the s signal goes omnidirectional, so basically it goes everywhere then this signal will go back to node two. And then it's gonna create a collision at node two. So in this, uh, in this work, we managed to address this, this issue by designing a very well calculated transmission window to avoid all these uh, issues.
Um, in addition to that, we also propose several other methods, but uh, well, due to the time limit limitation, I'm not going to talk about uh, talk about go through all every one of them. Now let, let's switch to a different topic. That is how to conduct efficient multi-hop routing. The existing routing protocol for the for the land-based wireless network that do not work well in the in the water. For example, the the note the mobility of the node can change the, the topology. Your your neighbor will will move away from you and becomes uh, not a neighbor. So how to deal with this situation? Also, uh, the other methods, they also have some, some issues, like, for example, proactive method. The overhead is going to be too much uh, because underwater acoustic transmissions use power um, several orders of magnitude higher than your wireless signal. For example, your typical Wi-Fi router, when it's transmitting, the energy well, the power consumption is in, in order of uh, hundreds of milliwatt. But for, but for underwater acoustic communication, while you are transmitting, you can e easily um, spend 10 or even 100 watt. So it's this is a huge difference. So traditional proactive matter in the internet will not work. Um, Passive methods like flooding is also inefficient and also that can create a lot of contentions uh, leading to collisions and, and waste of energy. So we proposed some, uh, some new method. One of them is called the uh, VBF. It's uh, what we call geo routing. So the routing is based on your geographic location and then uh, based on your, the, the basic the basic idea is simple. Uh, for example, if you want to send a mail to from New York City to let's say Los Angeles, okay, the post office is gonna send a truck towards Los Angeles, not going towards say Boston. So that's the that. This forwarding and routing is based on the, the location of the destination, of the source and the destination. But this can lead, lead to some interesting problem. For example, uh, in, in this, in this uh, chart, you can see that if you're just, if you use a greedy method, you just want to get closer to the destination. And you can run into a, a spot that there's no closer relay to reach the destination. So how to address that is another uh, interesting issue. And, and also how to do that in three dimensional world, like what we have in on the water system. Uh, it's still a an, an fascinating um, topic to, to work with. In addition to, to routing, uh, there are some interesting topics uh, on the um, localization and time synchronization. These two are uh, related and, and they are difficult in underwater environment. Why, why that is the case? Well, you know, it's difficult to, to find a, a, an object underwater. And that's, that's the whole reason we have something called submarine. If submarine can hide in the in the depths of the ocean, nobody can find them. This is why um, this is just showcase how difficult to find something um, in the ocean. Uh, in the in the in the in depths of the ocean, we don't have GPS, and also everything like I said in the water, they're gonna move. So how to do that? How to how to find your target? Um, just another, it is another interesting topic. So uh, in the, traditionally, there are different methods. 
for example, with the code. There's a range range based uh, method. Uh, this type of method um, try to measure the difference, uh, the distance to several reference point. And by doing that, um, you can estimate your location. Um, in fact, this is also how the GPS works. So your GPS, the, your, your, your handheld device, for example, your cell phone with a GPS receiver, it's gonna measure uh, your distance to several uh, satellites. And then you can estimate your, your position uh, in the world. Another type of method is called the range-free uh, based method. So this is a, a base. So this is efficient when there, there's no um, accurate way to estimate the, the distance. And this is what uh, work uh, well for the underwater environment. But the traditional range-free method, they don't, they assume that everything is uh, in its location. It's everything is stationary. So they are not very um, helpful for the underwater environment where the your device or the 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 robot can move away from its position. Well, even if they don't move, but they they they, they go with the water. So the mobility is still something to um, to to deal with. Um, Having that said, the range-based approach is still possible. Uh, there's, a, there's a number of research on that. Uh, and, and, and also, there's a, actually some devices to do that. Um, if you heard about this, uh, this term LBL, USBL, underwater GPS, and so on. But then this, uh, this problem with the with those approaches is that those approaches assume the signal goes in a straight, straight line, which is true uh, for radio signals, okay? But this is not true for, for acoustic signals in which it can, it does, in many situations, it does not go straight in the water. So if you measure the distance, but the distance is not the, the direct line. Instead, it's a curved line. Then your, your measurement can be off by a lot. So this is still um, some, a lot of work to do. And on this regard, we proposed uh, something called, uh, we, we published the work, the work to, to handle that. Uh, so basically, we consider the, the sound profile, so how sound speed changes in the water, and then we can estimate how the signal curves in the water, and then we can estimate its, its true position. Um, there are some other works, so we, yeah, we will not get the, uh, just the way to, to, to get bored. Um, We'll, we'll, we'll skip them and move on to the next important uh, topic for underwater system. That is, for example, how to support multiple users, especially when you have very long propagation delay and uh, very low bandwidth. Um, if we look at the existing median access control problems, Oh, by the way, medium access control, usually we just call that MAC. Um, traditional methods include uh, TDMA, uh, it's, it means time division, multiple access. So different users are allocated different time slot and they can only send signal at their own time slot. That's one method. Uh, another method called FDMA, meaning that different users are transmitting at different frequency. Um, it's also called CDMA. So every user has a unique code. Um, and then with that code, you can use that to filter out others' signal. Uh, 
Um, the problem with this method is uh, for TDMA based method, it's uh, you have your, your time slot. So this works well in a situation that everybody has a, has a lot of data to transmit all the time. And then you can use the, your, your bandwidth efficiently. However, if your system um, is not that busy, then that means, uh, or if some users are busy, some, some others are not, then you, you, may, you will not utilize the full bandwidth uh, that, that is available to you. Um, FDMA has the same has the same issue. For CDMA, uh, it has it is going to suffer something from the something called the near far problem. The near far problem is uh, for CDMA to decode your signal, all the sig all the received signal strains needs to be of similar uh, level. So it needs to control your cell phone. So for example, if your cell phone is using, using CDMA, if you move closer to the to the base station, the space station gonna tell your cell phone to lower down the transmission signal. On the other hand, if you travel further away from the base station, your base station is gonna tell your cell phone to increase your uh, transmission uh, signal level. Uh, on a terrestrial or land-based network, this is not a problem um, because the the tower can 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 basically track your cell phone, talk to your cell phone thousand times a, a, a second, so they can very quickly um, communicate with with the cell phone and determine the proper uh, power level. But this is not not feasible in the water uh, because the transmissions are so expensive uh, in terms of energy. Um, and also the delay is huge. So for one second, you're, you may not even be able to send your message uh, out for several seconds. So that means a very good control of your transmission power level will not be be practical, and 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 this problem can uh, can significantly undermine the the performance of any CDMA based method. So uh, we propose a number of uh, new solutions. Uh, we have we designed the uh, cluster-based architecture, one of the work um, uh, to to enable within the cluster we can have high-speed uh, communication and each each user can can utilize the channel very efficiently. And then between the clusters, instead of everybody just talk to the other, we have we have dedicated cluster heads. Uh, to perform inter-cluster communication. So this uh, uh, proved to be uh, uh, much more efficient. And then we also designed um, uh, other approaches like reservation-based approach. So the, the basic idea is uh, if you, well, just think about it. This multi-user problem, essentially it's like in a classroom, okay? Everybody wants to talk, but if, if there's no rules, everybody just if everybody just 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 talk, and it's going to be out of control, because there could be several people talking at the same time, and we cannot figure out what they're talking about because of the interference. Um, so we we introduced a pro reservation based approach, uh, well several of them. So basically, if you want to want to make a speech, you you reserve the channel in terms of frequency and time slot. So this way uh, we can, uh, uh, multiple people can utilize the shared medium uh, more efficiently. Um, and, and, and along this direction, we also uh, try to use a multiple channel based 
uh, Mac protocol. Um, and in recent years, we also uh, use, we introduced the, the uh, we utilize some machine learning algorithms to design better uh, Mac protocols. Uh, so basically you can learn from the, from the behavior of the users and then figure out if, if this is the time to, uh, to, to do the, to, do a, to conduct your own communication. So that's about the, the Mac protocols. Okay, so I, with all that said, these are all in theory. Okay? That's, that's a lot of a theory crafting, but I'm a person that believes the research should be a, at, well, the research will be at its best when it can bridge the gap between the theory and practice. So I, I developed uh, real systems, uh, both hardware and software. So in this, in the next uh, few minutes, I'm going to show you some of the systems we have built. So we started from uh, simple systems like this, uh, basically a very small kayak, a, a plastic container with a label on top, and then this, this is like look looks like a lightsaber, <laughs> but it is actually an antenna, RF antenna. And uh, we have our acoustic dev communication device uh, uh, beneath the, the kayak. And then uh, all the electronics are in this plastic container. So you may ask, hey, I, I thought your communications are all underwater. Well, uh, apparently we, we, didn't we don't have time to, to build a submarine uh, so, so that we can put everything underwater. So for research purpose, all our electronics uh, systems are above water, but only the communication device is in the water. So uh, with this, we can quick we can do some quick uh, prototyping, and then we can test quickly test your the performance of the underwater communication uh, uh, algorithms. So, uh, but the previous system can only work in the in lakes where it's relatively calm calm and and and, and stable um, but later when we are confident with our systems we decide to to go to the ocean uh, to do the, do the test but then going to the ocean those small kayaks they're not going to work so um, you can see that we have the weatherproof uh, casing and then uh, i work with uh, some some companies to build this, uh, this this yellow buoy that can flow uh, in the in the ocean, and uh, and later uh, we noticed we found we found that those buoys are too big. It's difficult to work with. Then we used we um, designed a smaller uh, use the, the this uh, flotation ring to hold to hold the the device, our device, and use a smaller antenna to make things easier that can handle by a single person. And later, uh, we, on the other extreme, we, we're, we're building some very capable, uh, uh, like gateway nodes for underwater communication. Those are very big. And, and we have this the surface uh, node that is going to use as the gateway. It has satellite con uh, communication capability, has solar panels so that it can it can work in the in the ocean for, for 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 a long time, and then we have these underwater systems that everything is enclosed in this uh, waterproof housing, and in these systems we run our own software system uh, with different uh, protocol layers and, and operating systems. Um, and this system, we deploy them in the in the in the ocean for for quite for quite some time, and they actually work pretty well. Uh, here uh, shows the way this 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 buoy is deployed. So, if you are not a computer scientist, you may not understand the, the the amount of engineering and effort it takes to 
to put something in the water and 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 being it, and, and it's still working. There's a, still, a lot of sub com, uh, sub components uh, to make it work. And we also design our own circuit board for all the the systems. So that's that's on the hardware system. That's just showcasing some. A number of things we deploy, uh, we developed in terms of hardware systems. We also develop our own software system. So this is called Aquanet. Uh, the structure is on the right hand side. Um, this is a software architecture, um, and, uh, and and it is designed for underwater system. The on land in on the internet. We use something called TCP IP protocol stack. So the left hand side shows the design of TCP IP system. But like I said, in the water, uh, it doesn't really work. So we have to use a different design. So that's why uh, we have the, the system on the right hand side. It's, uh, we design it to be user friendly and we also uh, implement it in Linux. Um, so it's, uh, you know, Linux, it's open source. It's easy to, to uh, design your own protocols in, instead of Windows. You know, in the Windows system, you cannot, if you don't like your TCP, you cannot change it. It's, it's, it's just how it works. So that's Aquanet uh, for running real system in the real environment. Uh, if we, if we don't have time to go to the go to the ocean, then sometimes we use a simulator. So we developed uh, several sim networking simulators for underwater systems. Firstly, it's called AquaSim. Uh, it has been used by many universities and institute. Um, as of nineteen uh, uh, two thousand nineteen, our software page has been accessed half million times and and recently we upgraded the the, the simulator uh, to uh, to work with ns3 another um, another uh, famous simulator so uh, hopefully by doing that we can attract more users uh, from the community those simulators uh, the they work well when you have when you want to test your algorithm in large uh, number of nodes. Uh, but one thing though is uh, their outputs are not very intuitive. So you're looking at what we call trace files, uh, lines after lines of of text, um, and and you really have to understand the the system to know what they what what what's ha what's happening. So uh, to make things easier, uh, I, I employ a, a master student to, to design a animator. So you can see as shown on this, uh, on this page, we can have a three dimensional, uh, we have, have a way to visualize what's going on uh, in the water. So it makes it um, easier to show, to show demo and explain to people uh, what, what we are doing. So other than those uh, software system, uh, we also have our test bed. So this is a uh, Aqua Lab, one of the first uh, indoor test bed for underwater systems. And later we have this uh, lake test bed. You saw earlier that the kayak um, to do test in the sea. We also later develop a, a bigger scale. Uh, Called Ocean Tune Test Bed. Um, four universities participated in this effort, and uh, you can see that those four universities covered four corners of the United States. So we can um, this test bed. We can see a, a variety of, of, of ocean conditions uh, in this country. Okay, so with all these uh, software systems, hardware systems. Uh, um, a test bed. Well, the purpose to to actually put things in the water to do some testings, and that's what we did. And uh, 
and and we realize that it's not easy and the well just like the what bob dylan said like your heart is like the ocean mysterious and dark which i'll, I'll show you later um, so in this section i'm going to show you some of the tests we have conducted over the years we used to work with uh, with woods hole uh, institute i mean uh, woods hole institute of oceanography the those are the people they, uh, who discovered Titanic in the 1980s. But we worked with them. Uh, we, we conducted tests together. We also work with other universities. Um, for example, University of, of Maryland to, to conduct tests in the, in the Chesapeake Bay. So just hold on a second. Okay, all right. So this is in Chesapeake Bay and we tested our, our smaller uh, buoy system. We also did tests in the Atlantic Ocean. So if you came in earlier, uh, early, uh, you saw I'm playing some uh, uh, pictures uh, on screen. Those are the pictures from our actual sea test. Um, and we have this uh, bigger system, more uh, robust, stronger system to work with the ocean. Um, and here shows uh, a, a regular day when we deploy the system. Yeah. So the sea is uh, it's not a, an easy place to, to work. But sometimes we we also have fun. Uh, for example, here I'm gonna play a video. How do I? Hold on a second. Hope you can you can see what's going on. It's uh, what happened was several dolphins are following us. Uh, apparently, they are interested in our research and and keep keep following us uh, for quite a few days. And yeah, so uh, sea test was not that interesting, but uh, you you can make you can have interest you can have fun as well. Um. Yeah, we went to many different different locations, different places in the world to to do the test. So this one is in the Pacific Ocean. We deployed um, at that time one of the largest underwater networks network in the world. Um, well, other than the the Navy, they 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 won't tell you what they are doing. Uh, so we don't have we don't know what what their capability is. But other than the Navy, I think this is the biggest uh, underwater networking system that has ever uh, deployed uh, by that time. And uh, we also did some tests in uh, the line, line and sound. So we work with uh, some oceanographers. Uh, some of them tries to understand how, uh, how the current, underwater current, um, uh, so how current moves at, at different depths, how water moves at different depths of the ocean. And they, they have some equipment that needs to sit in the bottom of the sea, uh, but they cannot get the data out in real time. So we help them uh, and we develop the communication system so that we can stream the data. Uh, we can send the data periodically and then the the scientists they can just sit, sit sit at their office and looking at the website and and, and get all these readings uh, 
uh, in real time. Um, I want to plan to talk about some uh, some issues we observed in the during the our C test. Uh, that's what I would call the little dark clouds uh, overshadowing the this research area. Then I realized that it's already uh, um, it's already uh, we are running out of time. So uh, I will. I will stop here, and uh, but before we I take questions, I will, would like to acknowledge uh, the people uh, I have worked, the pleasure to work with, my collaborators, my full, uh, former co-workers, and the, the National Science Foundation, as well as um, all my students. So. The uh, from the final remark, um, before I take questions, I I would like to leave you with uh, with one one final thought today, and that is the the water world has been fascinating humans for a thousand of of years, and this underwater wireless system. The network system is a it's going to be a game changing technology for the future it's it is it's going to be the technology of the future given only five percent of the water world has been explored every single step forward is going to be significant it's going to be remarkable for both scientific and education um, and also industry. So it's going to have a huge impact. Although this area is, is not easy, so there's a, there's a lot of challenges associated with it. Um, but if we can work together um, and uh, through this, uh, through our, our research, we can make contributions. To, to shape the future, to revolutionize the way we explore the underwater world. And who knows, maybe the next internet revolution will start from here. So that's it, that's it, guys, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, that's it for my, my presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to to unmute yourself and, and ask me. And also, I would like you to, uh, if it's possible, I would like to, to uh, participate a, a survey. Um, I'm going to post the link uh, in the chat. So please uh, click the link and fill out a survey. That, that will help us uh, tremendously. So. I'm going to stop my recording here. And uh, I'll take questions. <laughs>